So I'm going to kind of walk you through a little bit of uh, the way I discovered this information and the way I came across it, my logic through it, and the path I took. And if I walk you through the same path I took, you'll see that it actually is a very simple path. It's a very simple way of thinking. Uh, it's very fundamental and very simple axioms that um, just needs very little adjustments in our current physics and science and so on to generate just a little bit of a different picture that opens doors to a whole new way of being. I'll give you an example. Spiritual people tend to turn in terms, think in terms of infinity, that like this infinite potential, you know, that all things have infinity within them and all this. And the scientific community tends to think in bounded, closed systems of finite, you know, rational concepts. And so the two don't agree, typically. <laughs> um, the chasm even goes deeper. I think the deepest of that chasm is the difference between female and male. Women typically think in terms of continuum, in terms of curvature to infinity, like infinite possibility, everything is okay, honey, right? <laughs> and man thinks, in general, have a tendency to think in bounded state, you know, finite, highly logical systems. Here lies the problem. The idea that things can be isolated, that you can, you know, put something in a box, and assume that you can analyze that thing ignoring everything else that's going on in the universe. As if you've isolated that box from the rest of existence. Um, and, and more and more, as we advance in our technology and in our physics, we realize that that is just not the case, that that is not actually anything that exists in nature, and this artificial way of analysis does not lead to accurate description of the physics of our universe. So how do we deal with it? In one way, what we have to do is start to get what I call a holistic view of the universe. The whole thing, we got to start with a concept in which we understand the whole structure a little more before we start looking at the part. That is, we gotta make a clear, a clear, we gotta have a clearer picture on how the structure of embedded uh, system exists in our universe before we try to identify what the part may look like. Otherwise, it's similar to like taking a Boeing 747 and breaking it down to the smallest piece and then giving that piece, which might be very tiny, right, to an engineer and saying to the engineer, okay, what did that piece come out of? Could be problematic. Maybe instead of looking for a fundamental particle, we should start looking for a fundamental principle of division. And that's what I came to, is that instead of looking for a fundamental particle, we should start looking for a fundamental pattern of creation because if we understand the pattern then it doesn't matter at which resolution we are observing the identity we understand the principle behind the identity now we have the key to creation there was an internal universe and an external universe. There was go something going in and something going out, and the two generated boundaries. And that boundary is what we experience as reality. 
The thing is, is that in our society, the tendency is to spend a lot of time analyzing what's out and very little time analyzing what's in. Not only in our, you know, social morses, but as well in our physics and the way we do things. We explode things. That's how we build technology. Our concept of advanced technology is to put a bunch of fuel in a cylinder, put a bunch of people on volunteers on top, <laughs> and uh, light the bottom and see if they survive the experience, you know? It's all based on expansion, on, on, on explosion, on radiation. Very little is based on contraction, on going towards the center, on, on implosion. If you were asked to point at something in the universe that connects all things, what would you point at? What would it be? If you had all the universe, everything you see, and, you, and I asked you, find me something that connects all things, because you hear that a lot in the spiritual world and, you know, from masters that in ancient times and so on, that everything is one, right? But how? If you don't tell me how, then it's just a concept. It's just a dogma. You gotta tell me, how is that possible that everything is connected? Like, you gotta explain that to me. So, what would it be? Space. Space. Very good. Very good. Space is everywhere. It's between galaxies, it's between universes, most likely. It's between stars, it's between planets. And at the atomic level, the space is extremely high. Atomic structure, all of your reality is built out of 99.9999999% space. So everything you say is so solid, is so real, that you think of as your reality is actually mostly space. And it's oscillating, and the oscillations interact, and you... Did you know that you actually haven't touched anything at any time, anywhere? Nothing touches? Nothing? The densest atom is like... A molecule is a, you know... A uh, diamond molecule, if you grew one of the atoms in that molecule, the other one would be two football fields away if the one you grew was the size of an orange. That's how much space there is in between them. And when I touch this podium, my atoms in my hand are not anywhere close to touching the atoms in this podium. If they did, they'd be fusion, they'd be all sorts of gamma ray emission, there'd be some serious issues. There's large distances at those scales. All that's happening is that there's a little electromagnetic field here that's not in phase with this little electromagnetic field, so can't get through it. But if, well, if those were in phase with those, my hand would go right through it. No problem. Question of phase. And then the space inside the atom is 99.99999%. So maybe... We should pay attention to the largest percentage instead of the smallest percentage. We spend a lot of time paying attention to the point zero 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 one of a percent that we call matter. And we spend very little time paying attention and trying to understand the 99.9999999% of the space. So maybe instead of matter defining the space, maybe it's space that defines matter. And I start to realize that. Do you all following me? 
This is a fundamental change in consciousness to actually go in the world and first of all realize that you're mostly space and that maybe the space is defining you in, instead of you defining it. Space is not empty, it's infinitely dense. But because it's infinitely dense, then everything cancels out and it looks to you like nothing. Infinite mass. Meanwhile, we're floating in this. That would mean there's infinite amount of energy in the vacuum. And we've got a whole bunch of people on this planet going, dude, there's not enough energy for everybody. What are we going to do? We've got a war for it. So nature is giving us all the power we have today already. Right? At its most fundamental level, this is given. It is already free energy, if you'd like. What we need to figure out is how to extract it at its source. How to extract it before it's produced the material world. I started to see that maybe, just maybe, everything we see in the universe is just division of that energy density of the vacuum in various scales. You are in that mechanism, you are part of this conduit of information of the vacuum that goes from infinitely big to infinitely small through you. And as it passes through you, it picks up your specific interpretation of the universe and feeds it to the infinity of all things so that your participation is counted. Do you start to get a sense of your responsibility? And so there, you know, we start to feel that connection to all of the scales. But how do we get that feeling of that connection? Just a little side note on philosophy. We get that feeling of connection not by trying to connect with infinitely big, people say, I can't visualize that. Well, that's because your senses are fairly limited. But you have the infinitely small within you. So through that direction, you can connect to infinity. This is why most of the masters that have walked the earth have said, go within. The kingdom of heaven is within, you know, the Buddha is within everything, the Bindu point is within everything. And it's your connection to all knowledge. Then that means that our universe is driven by the vacuum, that the space between you and me connects us. That the information that is in the space divides in very specific scales, and those scales makes up all of our reality and that we're part of those scales. You guys are following this? Instead of matter being some kind of entity that comes out of nowhere, matter is just the result of the division of the structure of space itself. And you are interacting with that structure every day, every second, every billionth of a second. We know that all the electrons and positrons in your atoms are going appear, disappear, appear, disappear, appear, disappear in the vacuum. Every time the electron comes out, it's learning about your experience and then feeding it back to the vacuum. And learning about your experience and feeding it back to the vacuum. You are informing the universe. You are informing the universe about your specific point of view on the whole thing. And I can demonstrate that mathematically. And that's why people in the spiritual world are saying, you create your reality. Okay? 
the part that's missing in that statement is the other part of the feedback loop. A fractal is a feedback. The other part of the feedback loop is that reality is creating you. The vacuum is defining your existence. So, because you know what? If we all created our reality independently, we would never meet. We'd all be alone in our own little universe we created going, where did everybody go? <laughs> we'd be really bored because we'd, we would create exactly what we want every time and like, pfft. right? And so, but that's not what's happening. You're feeding information to the vacuum, and since the vacuum connects us all, it has the information of everybody in it, and it's feeding you back an experience, right, that's in coordination with everything else. So that there's a consensus reality. So that one being cannot overcome all the scales. So that one person cannot say, oh, you know, today I'm kind of hot. Let's turn off, let's, let's cool off the sun. And then the poor guy in Alaska is like, dude, it's cold up here. <laughs> right? But there is scale relationships. So the idea of the butterfly analogy, right? The butterfly in Africa that bats its wings and it makes a hurricane in Florida, right? That's found in many literature on complex theory, on the chaos theory. That concept is only true if you put it in the context of scales. You all following me? Like meaning that if e the probability of a butterfly flapping its wings in Africa producing a hurricane are really, really, really low. Actually, almost non-existent. Why? Because you'd have people in Florida going to Africa with shotguns going, Brah! <laughs> Don't you move those wings. <laughs> right? But maybe if you have millions of butterflies all moving their wings at the same time, now you got something going, right? So the morphogenic field, we're all connected. If we're going to move forward, we got to bring enough humph to the system so that it can modify, right? This is actually why I talk to people, <laughs> right? We have to move together. It is a consensus reality. And it's really important for people to understand that because then, first of all, you take responsibility in what you're feeding the vacuum. But as well, you realize that if it's not all going exactly how you want it to go, it's because you're embedded in a morphogenic field and you're interacting with all the stuff that's going on in it. You're all following that. So, you know, be kind to yourself is everything in the universe just smaller division of singularity? Singularity comes from the word singular. One. Are we only observing division of the one? Wow, this is starting to sound a lot like ancient texts and, you know, all these prophets and all these masters that have walked the earth that told us that. Maybe we should have tried applying that to physics. And I'm saying that the vacuum is feeding all atoms. That the material world is basically 10 to the minus 39% of the energy of the vacuum. It's just a little beady weedy leak, teeny weeny leak of the vacuum. And it makes up the material world. You all followed this? So imagine if we tap this energy that's in space everywhere, we don't even need to tap anywhere close to 10 to the minus 39% of it. You know, if we tap just, 
if we cohere that energy, get it to work with us just a little bit, just a teeny weeny bit, we produce enough power to power our whole planet for thousands and thousands of years. So now, these little protons at the center of the atom are not only infinitely dense, but they're spinning at near the speed of light. They're spinning at very high velocity, near the speed of light. So you know all these masters that walked around saying, you are light? They meant it. Can you like visualize yourself? Can you, can you sense yourself? Can you sense your atoms as mini black holes spinning near the speed of light? This is how dynamic you are. This is how energetic you are. It's an amazing thing. You're transferring information to the universe and back at the speed of light. You're flickering really, really quickly. Whoosh, the vacuum, to the vacuum, back out, to the vacuum, back out, to the vacuum, back out. So who are you when you're the vacuum? Have you explored your vacuum self? <laughs> There's other frequencies, there's other things, radio waves, infrared, and so on, past what we see, what we experience directly with our five little senses. And today you don't think about it twice. You turn a radio on, you tune it, and all of a sudden a voice comes out of there. And all that programming is in the space. I go to physics conference, and many physicists, it's now the trend. It, it didn't used to be 20 years ago. If you, did, if you said the C word in a physics conference, you'd get kicked out, you know? The C word being consciousness. But now, things are changing. It's the cool thing if you're retired or if you, you know, You're looking for consciousness and or the relationship of consciousness to physics and, and many of these uh, professionals are looking in the brain. This is equivalent to taking the radio set at home, opening it up and looking for the announcer. It's not in there. <laughs> it's just tuned. It's a resonance match. And that resonance match is a match to the structure of the vacuum. So when we look at the dynamic of our galaxy, and you know, based on the equations we wrote with uh, Einstein field equations with a torque term in it, the manifold of our galaxy is no longer in terms of geometry of space-time, it's no longer a sphere, but it's actually a double torus structure with vortices which are visible. We know there's a huge vortex coming out of the center of our galaxy. Uh, at the North Pole, we've been able to measure it, um, the North Pole of the galaxy, uh, if we want to call it that way. And uh, it's a large vortex, 3,000 light years long. And we know that the galaxy looks like a disk. And so those are the dynamics of the double torus, you know, with the torus on top and the torus on the bottom, like a sphere with two vortices and an equatorial disk. So then we have a direct link here between the space-time information, the space-time torque, and the way DNA is, like DNA is like the transducer from space-time information moving through into the world and gathering information. You're like a probe for space-time looking back at itself 
from the outside and gathering information about its existence. 